extremely well-spoken and famous figure at the time. 2,000 years later, it's his voice that takes us like a time machine into the moments of doubt when the Republic was fragile and the first triumvirate rises up. Robert, congratulations and a very good evening to you. Your Imperium, the first book, and Conspirata did not finish the story that we all knew was ahead. It was like a great big storm we knew was going to destroy all the characters. We meet Cicero in this novel as he's going into exile, un unwillingly going into exile in the far distance of the, uh, the parts of we know as the Greek Empire, Thessalonica. Why is he leaving? What about his regrets do we need to know to understand the conflict of this story? Good evening to you. Good evening, John. Well, uh, my aim in the, all three of these novels has to been to make each one stand alone. So each of the trilogy can be read separately and they can be read in any order. Um, this uh, dictator be begins with this man, Cicero, who you've described, nearly 50, washed up, finished, uh, having to flee from Rome in fear of his life uh, because um, his past, when he, he ran the Roman Republic has caught up with him and his enemies have um, conspired to drive him out of the city. And the enemy, the most obvious enemy is Clodius, uh, the rabble-rousing tribune of the plebs. But behind uh, Clodius uh, stands uh, Julius Caesar and uh, the other members of what was called the Triumvirate, running Rome. And, and the, the book opens in which, with, with something which was historically true, that Cicero had, had to head south and flee to try and escape Italy on exactly the same day as Caesar headed north to take command of the armies in Gaul, the beginning of his great rise to power. The novel is written in the first person by... Cicero's best friend and slave, as we begin the story, Tiro. He is an historical figure, if I read you correctly, and he lives a great reward. He outlives all of them. What do we need to know about Tiro and his point of view, Robert? Well, Tiro um, was, as you say, a real historical figure. He was Cicero's uh, secretary. Uh, he was and also an intimate friend, uh, a slave, actually, at least at the beginning of the book. Uh, he invented a form of shorthand and is said to be the first man to have recorded verbatim a debate in the Senate. Um, so for, for my point of view, as a narrator, he's perfect. He, he's alongside this genius Cicero at home and in the law courts and in the Senate. He sees everything, he takes everything down in a memoir. And the real historical Tiro, who lived 40 years after Cicero was killed, did indeed keep, write a biography of Cicero, now lost. So he's a very good pair of eyes to use to get into the complexities of the, of, of the Roman Republic. The sense I have of Tiro is that he is the, ma he is the record itself. He is the historian. He sees all, he records all at Cicero's direction. But he's working for a man who uses language as a weapon. And they all fear Cicero. Do I read that correctly? Not just at the beginning of the novel, throughout it. They fear what he writes, they fear what he says. They fear his presence because he know, they know he will talk. How did he get that reputation? Why, Robert? Well, the thing about Cicero, and the thing that attracted me to write about him, uh, is that he was an outsider, a brilliantly gifted outsider, who came from the provinces without a lot of money behind him and without any military uh, prowess either, and rose through the sheer power of his voice. He made his fortune, made his reputation as a lawyer. He was the best defence lawyer in Rome and uh, a brilliant advocate, and he made a political career as well. And the it's a very, very modern thing. You can almost say that Cicero was probably the world's first modern politician, if that's a good thing. And uh, that's how he uh, rose to prominence. And yes, you're right, people feared him um, because he could, he, he could lacerate people with his wit. Uh, he had a deadly uh, sense of humour. Um, the nearest modern equivalent would probably be Winston Churchill, who by sheer force of oratory could change things, could make people believe things they didn't believe before. And Cicero, uh, I think, was a model for Churchill, actually. I was struck, in fact, by that when I was reading the book. I wondered if it was Churchill I was watching when he, when he stood in the Senate. 
uh, a detail here about Cicero. He is he is a convincing figure, but he has in his mind all the time something he calls the Republic. What is that? Having spent so much time with his letters and speeches, how did it look to him? Well, the the, the Republic for uh, a man like Cicero was the greatest gift to the world that man had ever invented. Uh, it was a system of government uh, designed to spread power through elections, and it was extremely complicated. Uh, there were two consuls elected annually. They're like the presidents, in a way, of the United States, but there were two of them, and they were elected every year. And then below them, there were the eight senior magistrates, uh, also elected every year, and ten tribunes of the people who proposed legislation. And then the people themselves voted on all the laws. It wasn't the Senate that passed the laws. The Senate was more the executive arm. It was the people meeting in the forum who proposed and passed the laws. And this uh, extraordinary system of government, which fired the founding fathers of the United States, of course, uh, lasted for 500 years. And when it disappeared, it disappeared for 1,700 years. And uh, it's a thing of extraordinary complexity and wonder. And for Cicero, it's, um, it's everything that's worth defending. Um, and that's really what dictator is about. It's about different forms of power. Caesar stands for brute force. Mm -hmm. Cicero stands for a constitution and the rule of law. And at one point, Cicero proposes that this must be a the rule of law, not a rule of men. And yet again and again, I see Cicero in his interactions with his cohorts, with his colleagues, with his co-equals. Very much the strong personalities dominate. So much so that at these court cases or these hearings, and this is true in the earlier books, Cicero can convince the jury that up is down and black is white. He can turn everything upside down. Now, that is a magic he had. Did others have it at the time, or is it just Cicero? Cicero, I think, was the preeminent orator. Um, there were other very good speakers. Julius Caesar himself was a very good speaker. Whereas Cicero was ornate uh, and put on a show, really. Right. I mean, he did lots of funny voices. He made a lot of jokes. He made people laugh and cry. He was a showman. Caesar was far more classical, uh, far straighter, uh, simpler language, but very effective. And another great speaker w was uh, Cato, uh, the, the tribune of the people and the other great defender of the Roman Republic. He was a very fine speaker. But I think that Cicero was probably the best of them all. This is the story of Cicero. We, it, the, the story begins, a dictator, as Cicero is fleeing. He's going into exile for about a year. He's fleeing something called the First Triumvirate and its agent, which is Claudius. When we come back, what is the First Triumvirate and how is it that Claudius persecutes Cicero, this extremely famous lawyer? The book, Dictator, by Robert Harris. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. Robert Harris's new book is the third of a trilogy, and it's sad to see Cicero go, though he's with us 2,000 years later. This is the decline and fall of Cicero, a man of public strength. At the same time, he was committed to an idea in his mind, republic, whereas the senators, the ruling elite, and the people would go back and forth between who pays them well and who's more dangerous and who has the dominant story at this moment. Well, as the story begins, the triumvirate have formed, and they are extra legal to say that they act like dictators, but it's a three-man triumvirate. We need to, we know about Julius Caesar. We'll meet him again. He's the outsized general who operates in Gaul. But the other two are also important because ahead of us is the Civil War. Pompey the Great, what do we need to know about him, Robert, and his relationship to Cicero? Uh, Pompey the Great was... Um... Uh, a kind of a big, the biggest figure in the Roman Republic by far, far bigger at this time than Julius Caesar. He was the great war hero, uh, dominant, 
um, a big man in every sense. He looked like a, a, an all-in wrestler. Uh, and Cicero was his uh, uh, his man, really. Cicero supported him. Uh, and the disaster for, for, for Cicero was when Pompey formed this alliance with uh, Caesar. Um, they, he, uh, Pompey married Caesar's daughter, so Caesar bizarrely, even though he was older than Caesar, Caesar became his father-in-law, and the two of them made an alliance, and uh, Cicero wouldn't join it, and so Pompey, who'd always been his great uh, supporter, uh, turned against Cicero, and Cicero was obliged to flee. This happens a lot when the, what you thought was your ally becomes your enemy because of another relationship. And the third member of the triumvirate is Crassus. And the picture I always get of Crassus, always, 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 is a grasping and extremely, extremely ambitious man. Is that is that what Cicero made of him? Oh, yes. He was... Uh, Cicero never really cared for him at all. They were enemies. From time to time, uh, they would have to make peace, but Cicero never cared for him, nor Crassus for, for Cicero. Um, Crassus is, it's interesting, Crassus is one of those figures that you get in political systems, the very, very rich businessman who tries to buy his way into power. I'm not going to mention any names in your own political system. Absolutely <laughs> unnecessary <laughs> to mention any names. It's, it's a common phenomenon, and uh, that is Crassus. Uh, he was the richest man in Rome, or at least he was until uh, Pompey and Caesar outstripped him. And that was to be quite important, because the, the Roman Republic was really ru being run by these three men. Uh, Pompey controlled the east of the empire, uh, Caesar controlled the west, and Crassus was very rich. But the other two became very richer than he was, and so Crassus wanted to have his share of the glory. And really the beginning of the end of the triumvirate was Crassus being determined to go off and try and conquer what is uh, really modern-day Iraq and Iran. The story opens with uh, Cicero all in doubt, and he's in exile, and it's incredibly hot, and he's uh, he's marginalized. He figures he's lost his chance, but... His, his correspondence with Caesar will revive his chances. Caesar at this point is, has not conquered the, the Celts yet. The, he's not conquered all of Gaul. Versarend, uh, Versen, Versent, I'm sorry, I can't say his name, but the commander of the Gauls is Versen still... Getterix, thank yes. you. Uh, has not died yet. So Caesar is upcoming at the beginning of this story. Caesar from Cicero's point of view, is both admired and feared, uh, is my reading of the way you present Cicero. Was that in Cicero's letters? Did he have a mixed opinion of Caesar always, both both celebrating him and, and then aware of the fact that the man was a killer? Yeah, absolutely. The, the complexity of these relationships is, is, is fascinating. Um, uh, Cicero definitely admired Caesar in a way, and Caesar certainly rather liked Cicero. Uh, but Caesar was a much harder individual, and he was a military genius, whereas Cicero was always, first and foremost, a civilian. And as the rule of law, undermined by the triumvirate and finished off by Julius Caesar, gave way to whoever controlled the biggest army, so the relationship between Caesar and Cicero changed, and in the end, the book is called Dictator because, of course, that that is what happens. the 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 triumvirate became unstable, uh, and uh, uh, finally, um, Caesar triumphed, and and Cicero, uh, in the second part of the book, had to make uh, his arrangements, make an accommodation with Caesar. It's all about power and relationships between the powerful. And Cato. Cato is the conscience of the Republic from Cicero's point of view. What is always convincing about Cato, and as I understand it, George Washington and that lot celebrated Cato in the 18th century, so it connects to the creation of the American Republic. Cato was uncompromising. That exhausted Cicero, frustrated him, annoyed him. Did he find competition with Cato when Cato spoke? Well, again, a very ambivalent relationship. I mean, uh, uh, Cato uh, was terrific in many ways. He was unyielding. He was the very opposite of of, of the slippery and slidey uh, Cicero. Um, for instance, when Caesar triumphed in Gaul and wiped out hundreds of thousands of Germans and 
and Celts and um, the Roman Republic uh, Senate proposed his uh, 15 days of celebration, Cato rose in the Senate and said, on the contrary, Caesar should be handed over as a war criminal to the Germans and should be tried by them because he's brought disaster on the Republic by fighting people with whom we had no quarrel entirely illegally. I mean, it was breathtaking, um, a breathtakingly dangerous thing to do. Uh, and, you know, one cannot help but admire Cato. But in the end, his rigid, unbending view of politics uh, drove uh, the Republican side over a cliff. Um, he wouldn't accommodate uh, Caesar in any way, and the lack of subtlety helped precipitate the uh, civil war, uh, which ultimately dis destroyed the Roman Republic. And uh, Mark Antony, his name will come up in the course of the drama, and of course he is the driving force that eventually un unhorses Cicero and leads to his death. But as the story opens, as Cicero faces the triumvirate, Mark Antony is just one of a number of strong young men whom Caesar blesses, but uh, there's nothing special about him. He's descended, however from a man whom Cicero had murdered to stop a conspiracy, the Catiline Conspiracy. Does that give Mark Antony an, a, an edge over Cicero, that revenge? Yes, I think so. I mean, it's often overlooked, um, the, the, the fact that, I mean, what's really forcing Cicero in this novel to flee uh, was that he, he was in charge of the Senate when they put to, get to death five conspirators, one of whom, as you say, was Mark Antony's stepfather, uh, Mark Antony was only about 18 at the time, but of course he never forgot it. And uh, now, uh, in this volume, the sins of um, Cicero from, an, from the previous volume come back to haunt him, because, as you say, Mark Antony, who was a very considerable soldier who became effectively Caesar's second-in-command, um, becomes a, a, a powerful figure. And he and uh, Cicero are constantly... Uh, sniping at one another. They didn't like one another, uh, and uh, Cicero regarded him as a great threat. In the novel, uh, Cicero says he's Julius Caesar without the brains, uh, and I think that probably pretty well sums up what uh, Cicero thought of him. Cicero has a family, and will meet his family, and the one member of his family he loves more than any other, his daughter, when we come back. Robert Harris is the author, Dictator, the third of the trilogy, Imperium, Conspirata, and this, the decline and fall of Cicero. 2,000 years later, he's not going anywhere. He's with us. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. Robert Harris, his new novel. This is a novel. This is a work of fiction based on an incredibly written record about Cicero. Cicero's letters, Cicero's philippics, the remembrances of Cicero, because he was the dominant man of letters and a man who stood and spoke to a public, elite public and the people of Rome at a time of incredible anarchy going between the Republic and the dictatorship onto the empire of Augustus Caesar in the end of the BCE, the beginning of the AD. But at this point, it's important in a novel to establish the, the family man, Cicero. He has a wife, Terentia, whom repeatedly we're reminded he's not on good relations with, probably because he married her for her money. But he loves his daughter, Tullia. And he has a difficult relationship with his brother Quintus. And Robert, I tell you that when he, Cicero, was less confident in his relationships, I learned more about the man himself. First of all, the wife, Terentia. There, there's no love there, but there's respect. They work together. Is a Roman marriage at this level like a company? Or is, this a, is, this, is this like entrepreneurs doing well with each other? Um... Yes. The, the thing about it, Rome was it's incredibly easy to get divorced. All you simply had to do, effectively, was say, we are divorced, and that was it. Um, so marriages tended to break up very easily and very quickly, and they were contracted for um, generally 
not for love, but for reasons of uh, business or, or political alliance. Um, C- Cicero's marriage to Terentia lasted a long time, I mean, 30 years or so. Uh, and he stuck with her and she stuck with him until we get to the great upheaval of the Civil War. She stuck by him when he was in exile, which opens the novel. Uh, but in the Civil War, she thought he was a fool, uh, to side with the Senate and to side with uh, Pompey. And um, she was always the one who had the money. And uh, she she started to um, take the money back when he was in uh, away at the war and when he was stuck under house arrest. And he couldn't forgive her for that. Yes, she, uh, she, she, was, she needed to protect the money. There was a dowry. She paid it, but she needed to protect the money. And she started to extract her dowry out of his estates without him knowing it. Very clever on her part. Yes, very clever. I admired her for it, because he, he was risking all of her money with his political machinations. They had the ability to strip his estate, as they did in the end, correct? They took everything he had. Yes, absolutely. The thing about um, Cicero, which really made me want to write these books, is that he's a very rounded character. He is he's simultaneously very heroic and, uh, and yet very cowardly. He's very uh, noble and yet he's very grasping after money. Uh, he's very pompous and he's also very funny. And again and again, he, you know, there's this balance between him. He's a very, very rounded human being. We know this from his letters. And his relationship with his wife is particularly complex. And, uh, it, and it's one of the things that I most liked about him. That and, as you mentioned, his relationship with his daughter, right. Tullia, who is probably the person he most loved in all the world. Yes, Tullia is, we meet her, this, is, this takes place over 15 years, the last 15 years of Cicero's life. And we meet Tullia as she's unhappy in marriage and unlucky in love. But she adores her father. And that relationship is everything to... Uh, Cicero, and I did not know her fate when I started reading the novel. And But, Robert, you, you write it with this foreshadowing. It's awful to consider uh, what, what happens with her and her attempts to be happy. Does Cicero regard her as a success? You know, the relationship between father and daughter is striking, and I wanted to know if Roman fathers had a different and more... Um, affectionate to, uh, towards their daughters than they were toward their wives of their sons? I, d- I think it's impossible to gen- generalise. Um, I think that um, Cicero was certainly uh, one, an enlightened father and, again, an attractive quality of his, that he, he wanted her to be well-educated and uh, she clearly was very yes. clever yes. and that she could hold her own in discussions with him about philosophy and poetry uh, he had a much trickier relationship with his son, who was who seemed to have inherited none of Cicero's brains uh, and was just a bit of a layabout, really. But but Tullia did have the brains, and um, they became very close, especially towards the end of his life, after his divorce, uh, when she spent time, a lot of time, with him. And it's very striking that when he came back from this disastrous civil war in which Pompey had been killed and Caesar had become dominant, uh, it, she was the one. She was the member of the family who went down to see him, not his wife. Uh, and uh, she was the one who cheered him up and accompanied him back to Rome. Uh, and they obviously were very, very close, but she made the, a series of disastrous marriages, right. some of which he was responsible for and some of which uh, she was responsible for. Yeah, there was always money to be had and money to be found and dowries to be paid. Now, the relationship with his brother Quintus, as I read in the history books, Quintus and Cicero were close, but not. And you have Quintus enraged, deliver a speech condemning Cicero for having been selfish and blind to his needs his whole life. Uh, Quintus disappears in at one point in the book. He just disappears. He goes away. He's the soldier, but I'm struck by how recognizable a figure he is at the time, whereas Cicero stands... I, I go back and forth in reading Cicero, whether he's a modern, not really modern, I would say he comes in at around 18th century for me, whether he's an 18th century figure or whether he's an ancient figure. I get confused by his his ability to use language. But Quintus was clearly a Roman soldier and would have always been a Roman soldier. The reason, incidentally, why you get confused as to whether... Uh, 
uh, Cicero as a 16th, 17th century figure is that Cicero shaped the 17th, 17th century. I see, I see. It, it, and they all imitated him. Uh, so, you know, that's an important thing in the novels and an important thing to remember. Cicero, in his way, neglected and overlooked by history. We all think about uh, Caesar. Cicero also shaped the modern world and its sensibilities. Uh, but, yes, he was a much more complicated and modern figure than we would regard uh, his brother as, who was a soldier. He turned on his brother, and we know this from Cicero's own letters, and they, they were estranged badly for a year or two. And that, again, it's a, very, it's a very human thing. One can see it in a modern family. Um, the brothers who stand together and then in the end something goes wrong and all the bitterness uh, wells up. So Paul uh, Cicero, um, he really he loses his family and becomes a very isolated figure by the end of the book. Yes. And the only way he can survive is through his philosophy. Uh, philosophy and Tiro. And Tiro, yeah. wa- Tiro wants a life. He wants to be free, he wants to marry, he wants a farm, and the great satisfaction I get from this story, which ends with everybody dead, is that (laughs) Tiro wins out. Do we get Tiro's personality uh, from the letters, from the books, or is that you, Robert? Did you you give Tiro a life that we can't find in the record? Well, I used a lot of the record, so there's a lot of letters between Cicero and Tiro that I put in the book, and we know that we know that at the end, he, he retired to a farm and that he retired and, and was in charge of uh, Cicero's literary archive and that he was his executor. Um, we know that he lived for much longer. We know he was devoted to his master. We know that he brought out not only a big biography but a collection of Cicero's jokes, can you believe it? Um, and so he was, he was absolutely devoted. He was, he was like the Arthur Schlesinger to JFK. Um, I read him as uh, Boswell is how I read it. <laughs> Boswell, he was everywhere, and I always wondered whether he was changing the record when he was recording because they, they de- he depended upon him to go to the Senate and listen in on other conversations and then come back and report like a master spy. Yes, well, again, uh, it was often too dangerous for Cicero towards the end to go back to Rome, but he, he was quite happy to send Tiro to go and find out what was going on. I saw their relationship sh- slightly right from the start, is that between Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson? I see. Um, that uh, Tiro is the Watson figure, the slightly plodding uh, man who writes all the cases down, where, and Cicero is the genius who uh, uh, solves everything. And to a degree... I think that that was true. That's that's how they were. And genius is best described from the outside, which is why I decided to tell the novels from the point of view of Tiro rather than from Cicero's point of view. The book is Dictator, and when we come back, the last year of Cicero's life is non-stop violence and revenge. Robert Harris is the author. Dictator is the novel. I'm John Batchelor. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. The joy of reading Robert Harris's Dictator is that I get to live through the assassination of Caesar one more time, this time from Tiro Cicero's point of view. I had not seen that before. Cicero had been off to the side watching the conspirators, Brutus and Cassius and Decimus, and their fates uh, dealing with Mark Antony and what a bunch of dummies they let Mark Antony get a hold of the treasury. One more time, I have to go through what ifs. But from Cicero's point of view, and here's the question that Robert places right in the middle of the closing stages of the, ma- of the manuscript. Why didn't they tell Cicero what they were up to? He would have celebrated. He would have helped them. He would have planned it. He would have had an exit strategy. What, do we know why they held back, Robert? Were they jealous of him? No, I don't think they were jealous of him. I think that they probably regarded him as slightly unreliable. He was something of a blabbermouth, Cicero, um, and and, uh, liked to go to dinner parties. And uh, I think they would have feared that he might have said something. He was also curiously close to Cicero, uh, to Caesar. And, And three months before the assassination, he entertained 
sees her to dinner in what I think was Gore Vidal's favourite story from antiquity, and in some ways is mine, which is that Cicero was down in December uh, f- uh, 45 Five, BC 45. on the Bay of Naples, and um, Caesar invited himself to come to dinner and turned up with 2,000 men who also had to be fed. And uh, at the end of it, Cicero wrote a very funny account of it and said to Atticus, he's, it was oddly an enjoyable occasion, but he's not the sort of man to whom wants, wants to say, do come again the next time you're in the neighbourhood. Um, so I think that the conspirators were aware that, that Cicero had a friendship, in a way, with Caesar. Anyway, he wasn't brought in on the details of the plotting. He almost certainly was present in the uh, Senate when the assassination was carried out. Uh, and he was jubilant about it, because whatever his personal feelings were about Caesar, he regarded him as a tyrant and thought that now the, now the Republic could be restored. There was only one problem, as you say. They'd left Mark Antony alive, uh, and uh, they had failed to secure the city uh, after the assassination. They really needed to kill a lot of the prominent Caesarians, and they didn't do it, and in the end they lost. Yes, they lost in a way that is frustrating to read through. It's almost you want to re- reach back and change history. They lost because they didn't have a voice to speak to the Roman people in their anxiety after Caesar's death. There was no government at this moment. Brutus would have been the one to come forward. I guess that's what Cicero would have thought. He was the one who could speak. They needed Cicero to calm things down. And at this point, I know it again, it's wrong. It's 2,000 years later. What the Roman people needed was a someone to stand up and tell them it was going to be all right, that this was the way God wanted it. You know, you have speeches where Cicero will use that. He will say, when when the two consuls died in the battle in in uh, get, uh, during the the lifting of the siege, Mark Antony's siege, he has that little line saying the gods asked for a sacrifice. You know, to try to justify the fact that they lost two consuls together. That's what the people wanted. They wanted Cicero to stand up and hold their hands and say it's going to be all right. He didn't do it. Brutus didn't do it. The conspirators didn't do it. And that left Rome to the bully boy, which is Mark Antony. Yes, um, it was. I mean, Cicero said of the assassination, seldom was a deed carried out with more manly resolution, but a greater, uh, but an almost childlike lack of planning. Uh, and it was true. And uh, if you ever happen to find yourself trying to stage a, a military coup or right. a coup of any sort, right. you may kill the opponent uh, and then you need to secure the army and secure the, the, the capital city. And they didn't do it. They just thought that by killing Caesar, everything would be hunky-dory. The Roman Republic would start functioning again and everything would go on as before. They hadn't appreciated the whole thing was shot to pieces. Uh, which uh, Cicero did realise and saw that the only way actually you could save the Republic, paradoxically, was by some sort of temporary military rule. But they wouldn't do it. Uh, Brutus was a kind of holy fool, um, and um, they paid the price, and so did Cicero. And the end part of the story is, is, is very tragic, but at the same time extraordinarily compelling that Cicero, in his 60s, comes back and for the last six or nine months of his life is actually running the whole show again. Uh, Octavian. Octavian is, this is the teenaged heir to Caesar. Caesar adopts him in his will. The will rules the, the, the rest of the 2,000 years because we're still dealing with that will, with Caesar's will. Octavian is a young person whom Cicero misjudges, Robert, judges correctly, doesn't follow through on his judgment of him, doesn't perceive that Octavius, Octavian has the, has the ability to kill as necessary, is a shark who only advances the way Caesar was. Did Cicero misjudge him? Oh, completely. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Um, One of the historians, I think, I can't remember which one, Elizabeth Rawson, I think, of Cicero biographer, says it was was Cicero's misfortune to run up against the most formidable 17-year-old in history. And I think that that is absolutely unarguable. Um, Augustus, I find it a very chilling, almost psychopathically ruthless young man, but there was no doubt he was completely formidable and that he uh, outwitted and outmaneuvered the great old wily statesman uh, 
Cicero, and this gives the end part of the book, you know, um, it's, it's really very interesting um, to watch the way in which Cicero tries to play the young man and ends up being played himself. And in the end, he can only sort of shrug that he, he was beaten. I think he relied upon uh, Octavian, who he supported against Mark Antony and, and who he promoted. He called him this heaven-sent boy. He thought he would be the saviour of the Republic. He, he thought that Octavian would protect him at the very end. But, of course, uh, if it was expedient for Octavian to get rid of him, so it was. And, uh, and, and that was the end of Cicero. The pun that you introduced, that Cicero voiced, and then it was passed on to Octavian, praised, raised, praised, and erased, that pun. Is, that's a, is that in the record, Robert? That, and yes, that. it is. I mean, that's my uh, translation of the Latin. Uh, it's it's um, another another version would be tipped, tapped, and topped. Uh, it was a sort of pun on on the words, and it, it meant essentially it, Cicero jokes uh, that what they should do with uh, Octavian is sort of you know use him, uh, promote him, and then knock him off. And he did it in three words. It was a great joke. It went the round of the dinner parties in Rome. It reached the ears of Octavian. Uh, and Cicero was forced to apologize and say he didn't really mean it. But you didn't, Octavian wasn't the sort of young man about whom you made jokes. He wasn't big on a sense of humor. And it was, it was Cicero's tragedy, in a way, that he, he couldn't resist an amusing remark. And he made his career with his wit and his voice and his intelligence, and in the end it destroyed him. When they have the final scene between them, Octavian and Cicero, and Octavian tells him, yes, you can go, but here's what you must not do. You must promise me. You must not go to Brutus and Cassius. At that point, I put the book down and screamed at Cicero, exactly, that's what you're exactly to do. Go immediately to Brutus. He missed it, Robert. He missed the, uh, the occasion to, to save his own life when he listened to Octavian and made that promise to him. Yes, he did. But then if one sits and thinks about it, and here, of course, we're dealing with speculation because we only know a few facts. We don't actually... All the letters from Cicero have disappeared by the, for the last six months of his life. I think that he must have known that he should probably go to Greece, but I think he was too exhausted to go. He probably had a kind of nervous collapse. But on top of that, I think by then he was thinking, I'm 62, 63, I'm very old in Roman terms. All my contemporaries are wiped out. Everyone, all those people we've been talking about, Caesar, Crassus, Pompey, Cato, Clodius, all of them dead. Uh, I am going to die soon. How will history remember me? Do I want to live out a last comfortable couple of years in Greece? Or should I make a stand here? Should I stay here? And I think he, I think whether consciously or unconsciously, he decided to make a stand. And one of the most heroic things about him is, the, is, is his death. Um, when all his life he'd been terrified of the sight of blood and terrified of his own death. And at the end, he, he conquered that. And in a curious way, that meant that when I came to write the end of the book, it wasn't that tragic because we all have to die. And he would die rather gloriously. Dictator is the book. Robert Harris is the author. This is the third of the trilogy of Cicero, Imperium, Conspirata, and Dictator. But then Cicero's always with us. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show.